Buckle up, folks. This is gonna be one of them controversial ones. Let's get into the topic first. Music education. Do you need music education to write music? And the clear answer is no. People have been making music since long before there was actual music theory. Or really even music notation. And also, you can know all the music theory in the world and still write shit music. Just to be clear. Likewise, you can know none of the music theory and actually write a masterpiece. And before you list all the people that supposedly did not know any music theory or that could not read music and still wrote classics, those statements are usually wildly exaggerated, okay? That's, that's usually not entirely true. There was always a modicum of education. Or if there wasn't, then there was funds to have people help them, you know, fill in the gaps. To hire people, hire a team of people that could, you know, bring that education that was missing. So that the person in charge could focus on their creativity, which is what they're hired for. And you also have a lot of... Um, groups from popular music but also um, in film scoring where yes they came in with very little to no music education but later they did go and you know got that music education so I just want to make that clear it's not black or white it's not the whole you know this person knew nothing and they wrote classics or this person knew everything you know no no there are different levels of education and there are on the entire spectrum of knowledge, people have written masterpieces. So one thing we need to understand is music theory is made up. It's, it's not like a natural, we made that up. It's a construct. It's a way to explain patterns. It's a way to um, critically observe music, recognize patterns in said music, and then explain it and maybe enjoy it on an intellectual level. But the music was there first. The theory came later and just explained what was already there and why it was the way it was. To give an example from uh, my personal experience, I've been using something called modal interchange. Um, it's a harmonic language that I've been using ever since early teenage years, ever since I've been writing anything. But only many, many years later in, at conservatory, I actually learned what it what it was called and what it meant. I didn't know what I was doing. I was just naturally using that harmonic language. But only years later I learned, okay, that is called modal interchange and it's boring from this scale and this chord and whatnot. I didn't know the theory behind it, but I was still using it. I didn't know it had a name or an explanation until much, much later. Likewise, music theory is contextual. If you look at a chord, you can only explain its function either retroactively by looking at what came before or you can look at what comes after and then explain its meaning based on what comes after. Sometimes it has a dual meaning, like sometimes it changes meaning depending on what you look at. Sometimes it has more than a dual meaning. Sometimes we assume chord tones are missing but if we imagine them then it gets yet another explanation. Look no further than Wagner to completely confuse yourself about what anything means. My point is, you can have three different theory teachers and have them look at the same passage and all three of them might explain the passage or analyze it in a different way and all three of them could be right or wrong. They can interpret the same passage differently depending on how they contextualize the thing. And don't even get me started on jazz. These people can explain away any dissonance in context. You just ask them and they will explain it to you somehow. I'm convinced half of their chords are just clusters. But they will tell you, no, no, the root is missing, and then if you add this and you see it from this angle, then it makes sense. Why don't you understand, Anne? Well, why are you playing chords without the root note? Are you looking for trouble? Anyway, what I'm trying to say is, music theory, not like math. It's not, you know, one way is right and all other ways are wrong. The code is more what you call guidelines than actual rules. Now, whether you need music education or want music education also depends on the genre. Do you want to write like, I don't know, John Williams? Yeah, maybe music education, especially in the traditional sense, 
might be a good idea to get there. Um, but likewise, if you're more into atmospheric stuff or avant-garde stuff, or you're more into synth stuff or songwriting or, you know, so many other styles that just really don't depend on, you know, the traditional music theory, the traditional music education, where creativity and production and all kinds of other stuff is so much more important than knowing counterpoint or whatever. Another question that you should ask yourself about music education is, do you even thrive in that kind of environment and what does it mean, music education? For a lot of people, they like to say, you know, music education means conservatory training, college, university, you know, that kind of thing. And I don't agree with that. Not everybody thrives in an academic environment. Not everybody is good in the classroom. We don't, we're different people. There's so many different people and everybody has a different way of learning. And so maybe the classroom is just, you know, it's not for everybody. Maybe it's not your way of learning. Maybe you thrive in self-study. Maybe you have that discipline and you're just better on your own. Maybe you, you know, are better in private tutoring, picking your mentors. Maybe you're more of a hands-on person and you really need to learn by doing. I mean, you know, some people like to read a book. Some people need visualization, they need videos, they need demonstrations. There's so many different learning styles and I just don't subscribe to this idea that one is better than the other. It's whatever works for you. And to be clear, all of this is education. Reading a book is education. Watching a video, taking an online class, practicing by yourself, learning by doing is education. Another question to ask yourself is, what's your financial situation? The last thing I would recommend is going into heavy debt, especially in the United States, um, to go to some prestigious school. Don't do it. I would not recommend. Uh, unless you have wealthy parents that can pay for it or you get a full scholarship or something, um, I would not recommend because this can ruin your entire life because there is no guarantee for success. There is no guaranteed income after you're done studying. There is very little to fall back onto. I, I do not recommend. Even if you get a job at the end of your studies, you know, your starting income is gonna be really, really low. If you live in a big city like Los Angeles or New York, your living costs are gonna be really high. I mean, so many people are bogged down by massive student debt that, you know, is basically dictating their entire life, not just their professional life. I mean, there are people who really had to give up this profession, who actually had a job but had to leave because they could not afford it anymore. You know, there are people who are holding off on having a family because they're bogged down by this debt. You know, this can dictate the entire rest of your life. And so, yeah, I, I would not. I would not. Now, why this video? I personally have a bit of a strained relationship with academics. And this is where the gatekeeping and elitism comes in a little bit into the discussion. See, when I tried to get into uh, any German conservatory at the time, the entrance examinations were so difficult. A lot of them didn't even let me finish my audition. Um, and they basically just sent me away and were like, you are absolutely talent free. Do not pursue this, go do something else with your life. And I was crushed. None of them wanted me. And then I uh, went to a preparatory school where I, you know, I learned a lot of stuff that I needed for entrance examinations. Then I went to the Netherlands to study there. I had to learn a whole nother language. That was my fourth language that I had to learn to be able to study this, to get into this elite circle of people who are allowed you know, to study. And in the Netherlands, they have a slightly different philosophy. If they see potential in you, they will let you in. And then after the first year, they test you again. And, you know, they, they give you a chance. They give you a chance to catch up. And I really appreciate that. It's a much better approach, I think. It's much less gatekeepy, <laughs> in a way. And I got my bachelor's degree there. Uh, and then I applied at USC, and I got into USC. I did not get a scholarship. It's generally very difficult in Germany to get a scholarship because 
education is free there, so they don't really see the point why they should pay for some elaborate, really expensive study for you. So scholarships are a rare thing and reserved for very specific things. And I had savings. I had worked multiple jobs in the Netherlands to build up savings, but I didn't have enough for USC. And USC didn't want to help me. They told me I either pay or I have to give up my spot. I couldn't get a loan either, not in the United States anyway. I didn't have credit. I didn't even have a social security number, so you can't get a loan here. But I also couldn't get one in my home country because, you know, I'm, I'm, I wasn't credit worthy and, um, you know, I was going to leave the continent, so <laughs> they weren't going to give me anything. So I had to give up my spot. They basically told me, you're too poor to study here. So I went to UCLA and became a Bruin forever, because UCLA is a public school and therefore much cheaper. They also had financial aid, which um, I got a little bit of, and they also made it very easy to um, stagger your payments, and they also made it easier to have paid internships and stuff on the side, even for international students. So they made it a lot easier. So why am I telling that story? Because... Throughout my entire academic journey, I was told by most schools, I was told you're either too undereducated to be studying with us, you are too talent free to study with us, or you are too poor to study with us. And I have a problem with that. I really do. It's like this exclusive circle of education that I was just not allowed in. So this entire path almost didn't happen for me because of these people, because a handful of old, wealthy academics told me, no, this isn't for you. Joke's on them now. In fact, some of those schools have asked me back to give guest lectures. So they thought I was not good enough to study there, but I am now good enough to teach there, which already tells you something about their judgment being a little off. But I remember at the time it got me thinking, you know, how many talented people were there that just didn't get the chance, that were just told no, they were sent home, and were just not allowed to study this. They were just not allowed into that circle. And I have a problem with that. I have a problem with people's paths being cut off at academia, one way or another. And it's a continuous vibe that I've been getting specifically from the classical academia community. Um, I think there's also, from what I'm hearing, a similar group of people in the jazz community. It's basically, you know, the gatekeepers that think they have all the answers and only they know what's good and only they know what's real jazz or real classical music. And somehow they are the, the, the music police that decides what's good and what isn't. And people have been trying to put me into that box because if you look at um, mostly my kids' entertainment when I write just for orchestra, it is very traditional. It is very, you know, I, I do use my education. I do use the counterpoint and all the orchestration techniques and all kinds of stuff, specific harmonic language um, that shows that I have had that training. But so people have been trying to put me into that box and they, you know, in interviews and comments and talks, they always try to get me to say something like, you know, all music now is bad. It's because people don't have education anymore. And um, they want me to say that you have to have a conservatory education, basically. And I do not subscribe to that. I 100% do not. They think just because I like John Williams, I cannot simultaneously like Hans Zimmer. And that is absolutely not true. I enjoy Hans Zimmer just the same as I enjoy John Williams. For different reasons. But one isn't simpler than the other. One isn't more worthy than the other. I just, I'm tired of this discourse where some people think they are um, the arbiter of quality. That they decide this is good music because it adheres to some standard from 500 years ago. And this is bad music because it does not adhere to that standard. And it relies more on modern sounds and on production value, which is, by the way, just as hard to do. Like, no, I can, I can enjoy the Beatles and I can enjoy the Backstreet Boys, okay? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's just the way it is. 
I'm going to be listening to Queen one day and I'm going to be listening to the Spice Girls on another day. Shoot me. And I do not subscribe to this idea that with technology and access, music has gotten worse. It just upsets a very specific group of people that thought they could be the gatekeepers, but now they don't get to gatekeep anymore. The elitism is fading away. Because now people have more and more access. They have access to free resources, they have access to online resources, paid online resources. Um, they have access to technology. And some people are just upset that they don't get to keep the masses out anymore. The peasants like me. And honestly, I do not think technology has, you know, created a decline in, um, in music. I think it has made it more accessible and people who have previously been kept out can now, you know, carve out their own path. They don't have to face those, you know, five old people anymore and audition for a spot. They don't have to convince that label anymore to sign them. They can just make stuff and be creative. And, you know, just because some people don't get it doesn't make it bad art. It just means it's different. I don't get every genre. I don't like every genre. That doesn't mean it's not worthy. That doesn't mean it's not good. It just means I don't get it. But I think we're looking at unprecedented creativity outside of the restraints of what previous generations thought was good. Because think about it. Previously, you would only get to hear whatever they decided was going to be published. You know, only who got, whoever got supported, whatever band got supported, whatever artist got supported, whatever composer got supported by the people in charge, by the people with wealth, by the people with power, only those who had, you know, that bestowed upon themselves got published. Now we live in a time where access was created and everyone can actually do something without the whole gatekeeping aspect of it. And I like it. I think this is a good development. Why should a handful of people get to decide what's out there and what art is being made and what art is being financed and published? I don't think they should. Why should a handful of people get to decide what's good and what we get to consume? Those very same people have also gotten very upset by my free videos, specifically whenever I dive into the more classical aspects like orchestration with a variety of arguments that I genuinely disagree with. But, you know, the basic consensus is we had to pay for that information. Why are you giving that away for free? Which is a very weird argument to make in my eyes. And people who are genuinely apparently worried that by watching one YouTube video, people will stop going to school. Which also, no. If you really want to study this, you're going to go study this. But I don't understand why people can't just have a casual interest in something. Or maybe even, you know, with your video, maybe you create that spark that gets them interested. And then they go seek out further information. Um, they just think that, you know, YouTube and free resources are just contributing to the dumbing down of music education, you know, and to people not seeking out more knowledge. And I don't think that has happened, first of all. <laughs> but also, why should everybody have to go study and pay a fortune to get a degree? Like, not everybody wants... Look, I like to cook. I watch cooking videos all the time, even by professional chefs. That doesn't mean I want to be a cook. I'm not going to go to culinary school and become a chef. I'm interested in coffee. I watch coffee channels, different ways to roast coffee, different ways to brew coffee. Doesn't mean I want to be a professional barista and go to barista school. I watch all kinds of videos about video editing, cameras, lighting, color correction. That doesn't mean I want to go to film school and actually learn this on a professional level. I just want to make content. And likewise, a lot of people are watching videos about music production or, you know, classical music or orchestration or whatever it is that you're interested in just for fun because they want to know about it on a surface level and just enjoy themselves let people enjoy themselves please please why should people not be allowed to learn about whatever they want to learn about 
to the degree that they want to learn about it. It just makes no sense to me. And it's specifically the classical conservatory community, you know, academia, that get upset by my videos whenever I do anything that is not technical, that is not music technology or production. And uh, I think it shows a very particular attitude that I think needs some very, very heavy course correction. It's also, I will say this, a very Western attitude. You know, most film scoring programs are in European countries or in America. And most of these programs are very expensive. And if you don't live in one of those countries and have an income according to those country standards in the currency of that country, you can't actually afford a lot of that education. And I mean, even, even being middle class in America, you still can't afford <laughs> to go to any of the film scoring programs and not be in heavy debt. So genuinely do not understand these arguments. Just make it available if you want. Like, why shouldn't I? I can, I want to, so why not? But if you're one of those people that is upset that everyone now has access to information and to technology, maybe check your attitude. Like, why do you think this knowledge should be reserved to you and a pre-selected group of people and not to everyone. Just food for thought. Now another thing, ask me how often an employer wanted to see these. If uh, your guess was between zero and zero times, you would be correct. Some studios, if you want to be a composer assistant, some studios like to see you have a degree, but um, you know, very often if you can prove that you come in with the right knowledge, it's not really a big deal if you don't have one. Because they don't care where your knowledge came from, if it was self-taught knowledge or if you learned it from a teacher or on the job, like, it doesn't matter to them. Knowledge is knowledge. Now you might ask, why did I get degrees? When is it useful? First of all, I think I speak for many millennials in general when I say it wasn't really an option to not go to college or university or conservatory or whatever and get a higher degree. It just wasn't really an option that was given to us, to a lot of us. Like my whole life, it was just kind of assumed that you would get higher education. Now in the arts, it's always a good thing to fall back on a degree. If, you know, the career thing doesn't work out, you can go into teaching. And a lot of colleges and schools really do want you to have a degree if you want to teach. And it also, it does help um, me during a project having learned certain techniques. Um, it helps me because, first of all, my writing style in, you know, at least when I'm in the kids adventure genre is very traditional. And so I did want to learn that. I did want to learn the, the old way of writing, even though that's not 100% what I do now. But, you know, I, I was interested in it and I wanted to learn it, to have that option. And it helps me, especially on those projects when, you know, especially towards the end of a project, when my creative energy is at zero and inspiration is at zero, I have technique to fall back on. Like I have something to to grab and still finish the project, uh, which isn't to say that you would only get that technique from, you know, going to conservatory. You can also get that from self-study or any of the other avenues that I've pointed out in this video. But so I was actually always someone who did well in a classroom and who liked to read books and, you know, like, liked studying. And so for me, that seemed like the right path, the right way of learning stuff. And as far as education goes, my mantra is always like, what do you have to lose? You know, like what's going to happen? You're going to be too educated. Like the opposite is way worse. If you need knowledge or, you know, information or skill and you don't have it, you know, that can, that can put you into precarious situations. But the opposite, not so much. Like if you have too much information that you're not going to use, then whatever, it, no harm done. And I mean, if you want to be a professional in this, an expert, and you're really passionate about this, I would assume you would want to learn. Again, that does not mean 
formal education necessarily, but I would assume you would be interested and passionate about this and um, just take a natural interest in it. I always get excited when I learn something new because that's one of the nice parts about this profession or any arts profession. You don't stop learning on every project. I discover something new or in between projects I try out things or analyze stuff or read a book and I learn something new. Watch a YouTube video, learn something new. Um, I enjoy that. I enjoy that aspect of this profession that with every project I can discover new things and, you know, become better at what I do, hopefully. <laughs> like it always excites me to learn a new technique that I can implement in, in my work. Um, so yeah, those are my controversial thoughts on education. Goodbye.